about Ypsilanti's Black Civil War experience. Uh, we are calling it an Army of Liberation. And one of the, we're going to be just, you know, one way to set up this discussion and one way to think about it as we're going forward is to think about our Civil War as something different than a Civil War. I, I think we need to think about it as one of the great revolutions in human history, one of the great transformations in human history. And so our Civil War is really a revolutionary war. And our Civil War transforms uh, this country far more in terms of who has power and who doesn't and who has rights and who doesn't than our American so-called revolution, which really didn't actually give rights to anybody who didn't already have them before the revolution. The biggest expansion of, of rights in American history, and in, in some cases in human history, is the Civil War. Uh, and uh, the gains from that civil war are constantly contested. I think the trial today of Chauvin uh, in Minneapolis is a continuation of this struggle, right? And so one of the things we're going to be looking at here is not just how did Black Ypsilanti participate in the civil war, but how did they transform, how did they participate in transforming that civil war into a revolution? that transformed this country. And there is not an image that gets closer to that revolutionary wave of the Civil War than what you're seeing in front of you. And what you're seeing in front of you is a picture um, of uh, uh, black troops during the Civil War under a, a general, an a, a very radical abolitionist white general named General Wild, liberating slaves in North Carolina. So what you're seeing is people many people formerly held in bondage, now as soldiers marching into the South, liberating their, their fellow people held in bondage. It was an utter transformation. The people you're seeing in the, these pictures with those uniforms and guns weren't even citizens at this point, right? The actions that they're doing in this, in this image here makes them citizens, right? It, it, it is one of the things that brings black people to political power. It's because black people during the Civil War were not given rights. They took them in a revolution. Uh, and we're gonna see how that unfolded in this process. Okay, so let's go forward. And you know, if you joined us last week, this will be a refresher, um, but I, it's important to look at Black Ypsilanti before the war. What, what does it look like here? So again, a little refresher for us. 10% of Detroit is enslaved throughout the 18th century. Individuals will remain enslaved in Michigan until the 1830s and even later. So if you were a, um, an officer in the American military and you were from Virginia or something like that, and you were stationed here in Michigan up until the Civil War, you could have brought people bonded to you with, with you to Michigan. So there were actually people held in slavery in Michigan on military bases up until the beginning of the Civil War. Edward Matavy is the first black man we have a actual reference to a, in the historical record in Ypsilanti. Uh, and we know that Edward Matavy was born a slave, uh, enslaved, not down south, but in Detroit. And we know that he was denied the right to vote here in Ypsilanti. So that's, that's the beginning of African-American history in Ypsilanti in 1825. The first free African-American families to settle permanently in Washington County were families like the Arrays. And you can see a picture of Asher Array in the top right. And many of these families were came to Michigan just as white families from New England came to settle. And many of them had been free for generations. Uh, and so the Arrays are the first black family to own property in Washington County, and that's 1827. So uh, their black people are part of Washtenaw County's history before there's even a Washtenaw County. And I think that's important to remember that black people have always been part of Ypsilanti's history. White abolitionists were a small, often despised minority. The Liberty Party in 1844, the abolitionist party only won 23 votes in, in Ypsilanti, less than 3% of, of the vote. Small but black population in the city until the late 1840s. And in the 1850s, the black population of Ypsilanti will triple. And it's because the Fugitive Slave Act means that the only place for relative freedom for somebody escaping slavery or racism in the United States is Canada. 
And so that means that uh, many people escaping racism and slavery in the United States will go through Ypsilanti on their way to Detroit to get to Canada. So our geography is very important for how, how, how this community develops. Um, so by 1860, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of uh, black people will be living in Ypsilanti, a hundred or so black families, uh, uh, 10 or so percent of the population of Ypsilanti, which is, which is a, a much larger percentage than in most northern towns, large and small. Uh, for black populations in the pre-Civil War period. Ypsilanti has two pre-Civil War black churches, both of them founded by people who escaped from slavery. Both of those churches would have been active on the Underground Railroad and the struggle against slavery all in the pre-Civil War period. So again, Ypsilanti is entering, black Ypsilanti is entering the Civil War already with generations of political experience behind it in the struggle against slavery, already with generations of, of, of uh, negotiating uh, American racism behind it, right? Uh, so this is not a community that, where organizing and politics and struggle are alien. They enter the Civil War with a whole tradition already. Uh, and that, that tradition uh, makes the Black participation of Ypsilanti in the Civil War quite different than the white participation in Ypsilanti in the Civil War. Uh, Ypsilanti becomes a center for regional black communities. As I said, we have two pre-Civil War black churches, as does Ann Arbor. Uh, um, this area would have seen many of the leading black uh, abolitionists of that time come through. Henry Bibb and Sojourner Truth uh, would have all spoken in Ypsilanti in the pre-Civil War period. And they would have spoken here largely because of the black population here. Uh, which was the population that they were obviously organizing. We have black social organizations like the Prince Hall Masons. We have secret societies like the Order of the Men of Oppression and the African Mysteries here. Uh, Ypsilanti participates in the Colored Men's Conventions, which is a, a kind of movement in the North in the pre-Civil War period from the very, very beginning. The first Colored Men's Convention in Michigan is in 1843. Ypsilanti families will have participated in that. And again, many arrive from communities of struggle. Many arrived to Ypsilanti uh, as whole communities, in fact, not just as individuals or individual families, but, but groups of families. So literally you will see black families living next to each other in Indiana. Those same black families, when they move to Canada, will be living next to each other in Canada. That those same community will be living next to each other in Ypsilanti. So a whole community is moving through the landscape in reaction to the various politics that are happening, the social transformation that is happening in America before the Civil War. And what is that transformation that's happening in America before the Civil War? Slavery is strengthening before the Civil War. Slavery is as strong of a position as it's ever been when the Civil War begins in this country. So far from the notion that if we had not had a civil war, slavery would have died out naturally. No, there's no sense that slavery was dying out naturally. It was expanding. It was becoming more important in the economy, not less important. Uh, and, and the politics of slavery had defined, and anti-slavery had defined this country for the last 40 years. Uh, and that logjam had to be broken. And that logjam was the civil war. So in 1863, uh, as, as we know, the, the Civil War changes. So the first two years of the Civil War, 1861 into early 1863, this is a war for union, right? That's, that's even how we are taught of it at school. Things dramatically change in 1862 and into 1863. The North is losing uh, many of the battles. Militarily, it, it, it isn't able to gain a foot in the South yet. Uh, and uh, it's been already a year and a half into a war that people thought would last three weeks. And, and there's been no big changes in that war. Uh, and abolitionists were increasingly growing frustrated with the Lincoln administration's uh, uh, focus on the border states and white slave owners in, in Kentucky, in Missouri, in Maryland. And they said, you need to, you need to focus on the, the Achilles heel of the South, which is slavery. Uh, and if we make an appeal to uh, the, the, the labor pool of the South to withdraw their labor from the South 
and to join us, we can cripple the South's uh, um, military, right? So even if you weren't an abolitionist, even if you hated black people, the notion of abolishing slavery as a military tool became very, very important in terms of defeating the South. So you see a coming together of people who had no interest in abolishing slavery and people whose primary goal was to abolish slavery. And so Lincoln signs the Emancipation in 1862, and we are all aware, I hope on this call, that the Emancipation Proclamation did not free anybody, right? It's a legal document uh, uh, made by a lawyer who was president. And it is, it is perhaps the, the least um, moving <laughs> historic document you would ever read. I think there's only one even nod to the notion that this is an act of justice in the Emancipation Proclamation. But what the Emancipation Proclamation does is change the character of the war. Uh, and that is a pretty important thing. And, you know, in some ways, the most important thing the Emancipation Proclamation immediately does is allow for the recruitment of Black soldiers into the Union Army. And that will change the Union Army. That will change uh, the whole relationship between Black people entering Union lines. You know, when people were fleeing slavery and they got to, well, what do you do? Do you, you know, work for the, the, the Union Army? Are you a cook? Or, you know, do you just follow in, in the wake of the Union Army? And now, beginning in January 1st, 1863, you could be brought in, at least theoretically, into the Union Army as a soldier. And so what is the reaction of Black Ypsilanti uh, to the Emancipation Proclamation and the, uh, the allowing of Black men to join the Union Army? Well, Black men meet in Ypsilanti in January of 1863 to discuss this. And there's a Michigan Colored Men's Convention and many of the most important leaders of, of, of Northern Black communities are there, not just in Michigan. So Martin Delaney is there, William Whipper is there, and and uh, astoundingly, the man in the middle is there. And who you're looking at there is Osborne Perry Anderson, the only Black survivor of John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, the only participant of Harper's Ferry to write an account of, of John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. Sometimes I think we forget that John Brown's raid was a multiracial army uh, that included both uh, free Blacks and Black people escaping slavery in his army. All of them were killed or executed in the raid, except for Osborne Perry Anderson, who was able to use the same Underground Railroad to escape from Harper's Ferry, get to Canada, uh, and then he would move to Battle Creek, Michigan, uh, with Sojourner Truth, and he would participate in a number of Ypsilanti conventions. And here you see these Black men getting together, and they put out this appeal, and this appeal says, basically, we will, we want to join your army but we are not citizens of your country. So for us to join your army, you must remo remove the word white from your state constitution. That is the level of political activity and organization that black people brought to the civil war. They made demands from Ypsilanti on the Union Army. These people were not even citizens. They didn't have the right to vote. They weren't considered legal. They had no legal rights, according to the 1857 Supreme Court decision on Dred Scott. And yet they're placing demands on the American government for their participation in the Civil War. And that primary demand is, this is not a white man's war, right? This is this must be a war where black, where on the other side of it, Black people have rights, right? Not just the end of slavery. So even before the end of slavery, the issue of are we going to have citizenship? Are we going to be full members of this society is the demand for participation in the Civil War. That's in January 1863. So what are those debates? <clears throat> those debates uh, between Black folks about the Civil War are much different than the debates that happen in the white community around the Civil War. Is this a war for union or to end slavery? That's the main question, right? And, and uh, the federal government in the first two years of the war were adamant that this was a war to, for the union and not to end slavery. The federal government changed their position, which changed the character of the war. And that position was changed largely by the activity of African-Americans themselves. Right, the, the 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 general strike, as Du Bois called it, of of black plantation workers just refusing to work, sabotaging, uh, escaping to union lines. All of that 
Black people were voting with their feet. It really didn't matter what the US government said. Black people were doing it on their own, on the ground, in the field, forcing the issue with Union soldiers. So these white Union soldiers who entered the war to save the Union or for adventure or for whatever reason, now were confronted with Black people escaping slavery coming to their lines. What do they do? Do they return those people to slavery? Well, that's, you know, that's not exactly why they joined this war. Um, or do they allow them to? So each individual soldier sometimes even has to make this decision. And what you see is white soldiers, even if they're racists, many of them making a decision, no, I'm not going to return these people. That's not what I'm here to do. And this drip, drip, drip slowly transformed the war. It slowly transforms many white soldiers' opinion of the war. White soldiers received $13 a month. Black soldiers would only receive 10, minus $3 for their clothes, right? So you're almost making half as much as a white soldier just at the beginning of the war. Um, and so that's a real issue. The ability to rise in the ranks, the very top rank that a black person could get in the Union Army was a non-commissioned officer, a sergeant major position. So you would literally have to take orders from you know, racist white people. Is that what you, is that what you escaped slavery to do, right? Fatigue duty. Most black soldiers, especially in the beginning of black recruitment, were given the lowest jobs in the Union Army, making forts, manning forts, uh, building roads, those kinds of things. And of course, there, there was virulent racism on the part of officers and other white soldiers. So you're, you're joining a racist organization, you know, um, and all of these things were were challenges to black people and each time black people make a decision as a whole to to push the issue to push the issue lesser quality clothes equipment and arms what units to join so you know there are some units that are led by abolitionist officers really dedicated white soldiers who are dedicated to the cause and then there are many units who are led by career soldiers who are joining white soldiers who are joining the U.S. colored troops because it's easier to rise in the ranks, right? So who do we join? Who do we trust? What officers to trust? Many people are coming to us and saying, will you join my unit? Will you join my unit? Uh, after the war, what will be the role of African Americans in the remade union? Again, the Emancipation Proclamation doesn't free any people in bondage, but it changes the character of the war, and Black people are determined to not let this opportunity escape, and they will make this war one of abolition. And one of those men is Henry Stewart, you see there in that right photo. Um, as we said, in January 1863, uh, uh, the federal government authorizes the raising of black troops in the north. There have already been a couple of black regiments raised out west and south, so Missouri and South Carolina, but there haven't yet been any raised in the north. Michigan is slow to do this, right? So even though Michigan is allowed to raise black soldiers, it will be until the summer of 1863 that they actually get around doing it. Massachusetts has a radical abolitionist government at that time and immediately begins organizing uh, black troops. And so if you were really energetic and you wanted to go fight, no matter where you were from in the North, Massachusetts is where you went in the spring of 1863 because they were the first people to organize black troops in the North into the 54th and 55th Massachusetts regiments. So Henry Stewart here is a single 23 year old farmer from Adrian, Michigan, and he will leave that spring. Early that spring, he leaves in March with, a, with dozens of other men from Michigan to go to Massachusetts. He will join Company E of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry on April 4th, 1863. He's made a sergeant. You can see his sergeant stripes there. Look how proud this man is. He survived the assault on Fort Wagner just four months after, three months after joining the Union Army, but would die of disease in, on September 27th, 1863 in Morris Island, South Carolina, where he is buried in Buford. So he's an exemplar of those men who couldn't wait who were the sharp end of the stick. And about 100 men left Michigan to join the 54th and 55th Massachusetts Infantries in that period. Those uh, units, the 54th and 55th Massachusetts Infantries, will be led by some of the most radical white abolitionist officers in the Union Army. And many of them will, in fact, refuse pay themselves until Black people 
black soldiers are given parity of pay with white soldiers. So many of the officers, of the white officers of the 54th and 55th Massachusetts refused pay along with white soldiers until there was parity in pay. Um, we'll see more about the 54th and 55th Massachusetts in a little bit. So organizing the first Michigan Colored Infantry. Jan again, January 1st, 1863 is the date that changes all of this. March 1863, Massachusetts and Rhode Island begin recruitment. The main recruiter for black troops in Rhode Island is Martin Delaney, the father of black nationalism. And he will come to Ypsilanti to recruit to the 11th Rhode Island Heavy Artillery. And he will recruit a couple of men from Ypsilanti to the 11th Heavy Artillery, which ended up uh, 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 being a large unit down in, um, in New Orleans, and they actually published their own newspaper, the, the Black Warrior, uh, uh, there. Um, in March 1863, there are ferocious anti-Black riots in Detroit. Ypsilanti troops, not for the first or last time, will be called to Detroit to pull, put down disturbances. Uh, and I think that that should, all, you know, that that's also part of the resistance is not, you know, the part of the resistance to black people joining in the Union Army are mobs of white people, right? Mobs of white racists. And people may be familiar with the New York City draft riots. Uh, the riots we have in Detroit predate those by a couple of months, uh, but are part of the same white reaction in the North to the increasing presence of black or the increasing participation of black people in the war and the increasing focus on abolition in the war. In July, 1863, Secretary of War Stanton authorizes Michigan Governor Austin Blair to organize the regiment. That same month, all of those men who have left uh, to join the 54th and 55th Massachusetts are in the Battle of Fort Wagner, uh, which we'll look at uh, just in a moment. And so remember that battle happens only about two or three months after these men join. Detroit Tribune editor Henry Barnes leads the effort. He's a white man. Uh, he's accused of uh, leading this effort as a way to defraud black soldiers of their bounties that they get during uh, uh, for joining the Union Army. And in fact, after the Civil War, many of these black men who joined what would become the 102nd United States Colored Troops would have a legal suit against Henry Barnes to try to get some of the bounty that he stole from them um, uh, 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 returned to them. So you can see even people who you think have your best interest as hearts, this radical abolitionist editor of, the, of a Detroit newspaper, he's a white man who figures he can make a little money off of this too. Uh, and so again, who do you trust? Who do you trust? Um, Sojourner Truth, George de Baptiste and William Lambert, leading African Americans in Michigan will lead efforts to organize black public opinion. On August 12th, 1863, uh, direct re recruitment is commenced, and that will be at Camp Ward in Detroit, which is right near Elmwood Cemetery. Uh, there's a school over there, and I can't remember the name of the old high school, but it's on the grounds of that old high school. Uh, December 18th, 8, 1863, about 250 soldiers tour the state on a train, uh, uh, recruiting enlistees, including in Ypsilanti. And we actually see that here. So you see, in Cass County, in the middle there, it says Colored Regiment, and I'll get my cursor because you can't see me pointing at it. Colored Regiment, about 200 members of the 1st Regiment Michigan Colored Troops paid this village a visit on Monday last. They were preceded by an excellent band, also Negroes. The troop were a fine looking body of men and seemed to be composed of the material of which soldiers are made. Owing to the severe snowstorm, which raged during the entire day and through which they had marched from Cassopolis a distance of 10 miles, they did not favor our citizens with an exhibition of their proficiency in drill but we are assured that they are fully equal to any troops who have been in the service no longer than they. Our citizens, although taken entirely surprised, soon provided an excellent dinner, which was served up in the freight house and to which the men did ample justice. They left on the 1920 train for Detroit. So also you can see that you can take a train from St. Joseph's to Detroit every day and we can't do that either. So it was actually easier to move around the state in 1861 than it is today. But that's interesting to read this. So you can see them moving around uh, uh, the state organizing. And we know, I mean, I have the list of the, the men who joined from Ypsilanti on December 8th, 1863. So we can see who joined that day when the train came to Ypsilanti. And two, two young men joined that day, David and George York, along with a, a, a number of other people. 
Uh, you can see down there, Sojourner Truth has been carrying food and clothing to Michigan college soldiers. She is now 80 years old and says she wants to live till all her people are free. Sojourner Truth would become like the patron of Michigan black troops. So she would be in Camp Ward delivering food and clothes. And then she would actually go down to South Carolina when they were in the field at 80 years old, over 80 at that point, her and George de, de Baptiste traveled to South Carolina, to the off the coast of South Carolina, to deliver food, clothing, and then to report back uh, to uh, the communities here in, in Michigan on the welfare of their sons and fathers and brothers uh, in, 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 in South Carolina. On February 17th, 1864, so again, this is almost three years into the war, right? The war begins April 1861. So we're three years into the war. Michigan Colored Regiment is mustered into service in Detroit. So finally, the full complement of the regiment, about a thousand people have been recruited and it is now drilling and getting ready to go into the field. So Camp Ward, racism and desertion. Again, that camp is at Shane and Lafayette. Uh, in March 1863, there were fierce anti-Black riots in Detroit. The Detroit Free Press is a notoriously racist anti-Black newspaper who is constantly writing against the recruitment of Black troops. Um, th there's absolutely squalid conditions in Camp Ward. So people are coming in the winter in Detroit, right? It's winter. It's it's December, January, uh, February, March. It's freezing. People are living in shacks. We actually see quite a number of people desert during this period because this is not what they signed up for. And it, you will not see any desertions in the 102nd United States Colored Troops except for one when they are in the field. But in Detroit, you see a, quite a few desertions. And I think it's because of the racism, the lack of clothing, all of that. I mean, it, it's just not what people signed up for. On March 28, 1864, the unit leaves Detroit for Annapolis, Maryland, where it joins the U.S. Army North Corps by train. And we can see that, we can see a couple of that, those here. And one of them has a, um, a, a reference to the flag that these men are carrying as they, in Annapolis, given to them by the black women of Detroit. So troops are arriving here daily. Part of the 3rd New Jersey Cavalry came yesterday, the 17th Michigan last night. And a few days ago, I observed marching through their encampment, the 1st Michigan Colored Regiment. They marched to good music of a brass band of their own color. They carried the good old flag of the stars and stripes on one side it read, presented by the Soldiers Aid Society of Detroit. And the other side it read, all men are born free and equal to realize which we fight. Right? So there is no doubt what these men are going into battle for. There is no doubt. It's on their flag. It's on their flag. Uh, on April 13th, 1864, General Grant reviews the 102nd with General Birdside. The following day, they board steamers for South Carolina's Sea Islands. Five days later, they arrive at Hilton Head, South Carolina. So let's look at that. Why South Carolina? What's going on? Uh, I think a lot of people have heard of the Sea Islands. Uh, many people have heard of this island, Hilton Head, which is now uh, a resort island. And here is what that island looked like at the Civil War. And it was one large plantation, one large plantation. These Sea Islands off the coast of South Carolina and going down into Georgia here, and even a little up into North Carolina over here, are a unique African-American world. Um, and as if people know about those islands today, this is where the Gullah culture lives. This is, um, this is a place in North America where African traditions and African cultures and African language have survived. Uh, there's reasons for that. One of the reasons is that while many um, uh, people who were enslaved in Africa were brought to work cotton plantations, right? And uh, you were brought in uh, and you were mixed up, right? So wherever you were taken, you were mixed up to kind of try to divide you and make sure you couldn't speak a common language and have a common culture that you could act then against the slave owner. So it was a real concerted effort to, to kind of divide and atomize people up from communities in Africa. But on the sea islands, they were growing very specific things. They were growing rice and indigo uh, along with cotton. But that rice and indigo required a, a, a skilled laborer. It required people who knew how to do that. And so the uh, people brought to the Sea Islands in Charleston right there is the main entry point of people in, from Africa and the slave trade into North America is into Charleston Harbor there. 
And so, you know, the first, basically it's the first stop from Africa. And because people were um, uh, being used for a specific industry, indigo and, and rice, people were brought from very specific parts of Africa where they had those abilities. They had gained those abilities. They knew how to grow those things. And so communities were kept together on the Sea Islands. Also on the Sea Islands, the only white people are the overseers and the plantation owners. So, you know, those Sea Islands have several hundred white people and tens of thousands of people of African descent. Uh, and, and so you get a unique African-American world there. You, it's very African to this day. And, um, and that is one of the first places to be liberated by the Union Army. What happens is the Union Army, Fort Sumter at, in Charleston, kind of where that Fort Wagner thing is, is bombed in 1861. That begins the start of the Civil War. The Union Navy goes down there and is a, the Union Navy is able to scare the white folks, uh, the plantation owners off of those islands. So literally black people just rise up and take over the plantations when the Union Army shows up off the coast of those those islands. And you get a kind of beginning of black self-determination. You get a look at what reconstruction might have been like on the Sea Islands. So black people organize themselves to take over plantations. They organize the work in the plantations. Uh, when the Union Army arrives, they work with General Mitchell to create an independent black town with a black mayor called Mitchellsville on the Sea Islands. And because it's one of the first places and it's a majority black place, and it's also, frankly, not in the seat of war. So it's it's away from the main theater of battle. Uh, many abolitionists, both black and white, will go to the Sea Islands uh, immediately after they're liberated in early 1861. Now, remember, these islands are liberated here, right off the coast, but this is the solid South right there. Charleston is the cockpit of the Confederacy. It's not the capital, but it's the most important political city of the Confederacy. Uh, so these islands are off the coast, right off the coast of sort of the seat of the Confederacy. Uh, and, and so the battle will be then to get soldiers off of these islands to fight the Confederates on the main, the mainland. Uh, but what you see is all of these abolitionists and all of these reformers uh, go down to the Sea Islands. People set up schools, people set up churches, all these kinds of things. And uh, they also ask for black troops to defend the Sea Islands uh, so, th so that it wouldn't seem like white army of occupation. And frankly, it was a way in, for some Union officers to get rid of black troops, right? Send them down to the Sea Islands, send them down to the Sea Islands. But what you see is a demand from the Union Army and the Sea Islands for black troops. And that's why the 102nd United States Colored Troops from Michigan is sent to the Sea Islands. And there they will join those hundreds of men who have already left Michigan to join the 54th and 55th Massachusetts. So even though they were separated at the beginning of the war, those three groups of men, the 54th, 55th, and the 102nd will all serve together on the, the islands off the coast of South Carolina. And we know that Ypsilanti men in those three units will get together and have Prince Hall Mason meetings. They will have meetings to bury their dead from Ypsilanti and try to raise money to get people sent back to Ypsilanti when they've died, things like that. So we know that Ypsilanti remains a community even among these divergent uh, units, the 54th, 55th Massachusetts, the 102nd United States Colored Troops. So Fort Wagner, you notice, is right there off the coast of Charleston. It is one of the forts that is defending the entrance to the main harbor of the Confederacy. That main harbor of the Confederacy would be open, blockaded, but open until almost the very end of the war. So there was constantly attempts to take the, um, the Confederate fortresses around the harbor so that the harbor could then be taken. But these were incredibly hard fortresses to take. One of them was called Fort Wagner. And in July 1863, the 54th Massachusetts, which is, um, again, it, it is perhaps the most elite Black unit in the Civil War. Frederick Douglass's uh, sons served in the 54th Massachusetts, as does Sojourner Truth's great grand or grandson, as does George de Baptiste's children. Many of the leading Black figures in the North, their children will serve in the 54th Massachusetts. 
The 54th Massachusetts is led by radical white abolitionist officers. And early in the war, remember how we were saying that black soldiers had to do fatigue duty. They was combat was generally not uh, the purview of black troops. And uh, it was thought in lunacy, it was thought that uh, slavery had made black men docile and they would not fight. Nothing could be further from the truth, but this is what white officers generally thought. And so black people were not generally put into the field. And, uh, and so the 54th Massachusetts demands to lead what is really a suicidal assault on, the, on Fort Wagner in July 18th, 1863, to prove to white officers that black men would die, fight and die, right? So this was a blood sacrifice to say to white officers, we want to fight for our own freedom and we, are, we will show you how ferociously we will fight for it. We will have this suicidal charge onto Fort Wagner. And that's what happened. It wasn't just black troops who were engaged in that suicidal charge, but it was black troops who led that suicidal charge. Uh, and if anybody has seen the movie Glory, um, you've seen a cinematic representation of that of that charge. It is one of the most, no, it is the most iconic moment for black, uh, for all of uh, black participation in the Civil War. This um, the painting that you're seeing there actually hung for the rest of his life over Frederick Douglass's desk, right? So that's how important this moment was in the Civil War. About half of the 54th Massachusetts who went up uh, to attack uh, Fort Wagner were killed, wounded, or missing. You can imagine what it was like for a Black soldier to be captured by the Confederates. A number were captured by the Confederates at Fort Wagner, a number were sold back into slavery, some were executed on the spot, and others were sent to Andersonville prison to die. Uh, being captured uh, uh, by the Confederates was a death sentence, right? It was no quarter given for Black people, often, often. And frankly, for Black soldiers, there was often no quarter given for Confederates. That's, that's the level we're working with. Uh, eight Ypsilanti men, participated in the charge on Fort Wagner. Two, uh, Charles Augustus and John Leatherman would die. Five others would be wounded. So nearly every Ypsilanti man who assaulted Fort Wagner was either killed or wounded. And this is just the beginning of the 54th Massachusetts activity. This is just in the first months of its activity. It will fight another two years in this war. So here's the Ypsilanti men joined the 54th and 55th Massachusetts, and I just want to say their name. Charles Augustus was 30. He was killed. Actually, we, we now have confirmation he was killed before Wagner. Uh, I thought for a long time he was just missing, and how horrible uh, to not know ever what happened to your uh, father, your husband, your son. Uh, but we found recently, just in the last week, I found confirmation in the, the pension file of his daughter that, in fact, his body was seen twice in front of Fort Wagner by other Black troops. Solomon Day, who was uh, from down near Pittsfield and, um, and Carpenter, or, or, or uh, 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 Packard, uh, Packard and uh, uh, Ellsworth area, Packard and Michigan Avenue area. Uh, Napoleon Hamilton, also a farmer. John Leatherman. Uh, was wounded at Wagner, and he was one of those to die at Andersonville. Daniel Ross was also from Ypsilanti. He would be wounded at another battle called uh, Honey Hill. Elias Rouse, 22, laborer, was wounded, and there's his grave here in Ypsilanti. So we have one of these heroes buried right here at Highland Cemetery. Charles Scott, 24, laborer. He was wounded at Wagner. He's actually killed in one of the final battles of the war. We'll look at that later. John Byrd is a barber. Uh, he dies of disease on Foley Island in South Carolina. He's in the 55th. William Casey is the founder of Ypsilanti's Second Baptist Church. Look how old he is when he joins the 55th. He's 40 years old. And in fact, he's actually 48 when he joins. 40 was the cutoff date, so that's the name he gave. He was too old but um, to join, but he was adamant. So they made him a nurse. So he was a nurse for fellow soldiers all during the Civil War. And when his company, Company D, signed a petition to President Lincoln refusing any pay until there was equal pay with white soldiers, his was the last name on the petition. And I think it was the last name on, and it was written like John Hancock's in a huge, huge handwriting. And I think it's because he was the oldest 
man in the unit. I think that he had a, a position of reverence because of that. And he was dogged in his determination <coughs> to follow the Union Army and to follow the 55th Massachusetts. And again, this is the man who founded Ypsilanti's Second Baptist Church. He even the man who gave his entire uh, life savings over to buy the property on the corner of Catherine and Hamilton. It's one of the last things he did before he died. So where the church is today, thanks a lot to this man who also escaped from slavery. He's a man who escaped from slavery. And you can read his obituary and he talks about he hated slavery because he was denied to read and write. And that's, he hated it because of that. And it says he hated it with a deathless death. I don't know what that means, but it sounds like he really hated it. James W. Wood was a stableman. Nelson H. Wilson was a laborer. All of them joined the 55th. And basically the 55th is formed because so many men go across the country to join the 54th that there's too many. So they have to join, they have to have another unit. Okay, so the Port Royal Experiment, we call, it's called the Port Royal Experiment wasn't called that then, but it was. There's a book called that, and Port Royal is the main town, uh, or the main island on uh, town uh, and island uh, um, in the Sea Islands, uh, and and uh, this was a model of what Reconstruction could have been, where African Americans worked the land abandoned by plantation owners, owning plots and becoming self-sufficient. In 1861, again, the Union Navy arrived off the coast of South Carolina, white plantation owners fled, leaving over. 10,000 formerly enslaved. Northern charity organization abolitionists came opening schools and ch churches. Black troops from the North were requested to garrison and protect the Sea Islands. Also the first um, South Carolina colored infantry call, later called the 33rd United States Colored Troops organized by Thomas Wentworth Higginson uh, was, was one of the first black units ever organized in the entire country, the first South Carolina, and was organized off the coasts of the Sea Island. And so these pictures that you're seeing are pictures not of slavery, but of post-slavery. These are black people organizing their own labor in on, on the former plantations. And then on the bottom there, you see this wonderful, weeping, beautiful tree and an open school uh, for newly freed children uh, uh, being open. And that picture was taken during the Civil War. So there's combat, you know, just off the islands while that picture is being taken. Again, you let's look at some of these pictures. You see an, on where it says the Port Royal Experiment. You hear, Here you see people escaping from slavery off the coast of South Carolina to get to those islands. Uh, on the top right, you see a picture of those first Southern, uh, first South Carolina colored volunteers. And that picture is taken in Port Royal. Uh, on the bottom right, you see a picture of George de Baptiste, a leading black abolitionist from Detroit who traveled with Sojourner Truth and was patron to uh, black soldiers from Michigan. Um, in 1863, General Mitchell authorized the forming of a town, it's called Mitchellville on Hilton Head, demanded by the Islanders and run by the black populations themselves. This will be the first town in the United States with a black mayor, the very first one. In 1865, President Johnson ends the experiment, returning its land to its previous white owners, right? So we, we had a brief moment here on these islands. Robert Smalls, who many people ha may have known, represented the Sea Islands until well after Reconstruction ended. It was one of the places in the South that had an overwhelmingly black population, very little white population. So it was almost impossible for a white man of any party to be elected off the coast of South Carolina. So even after white supremacy is reinstituted in South Carolina with the collapse, with the, with the reconstitution of, of, of the old bourbon class, uh, uh, Robert Smalls still will represent uh, the Sea Islands in Congress when he will be the only black representative in Congress. Life on the islands. So again, Michigan troops are reunited with, uh, with um, troops from Massachusetts. And many of these black troops from Michigan would have been northerners, right? Some would have been born in Canada. Many would never have been to the South, never have been to the South. And quite a few of these men would marry women uh, from the, the uh, islands. And some of these women were born in Africa. And some of these women came back to Michigan with these men. And I, I, I think that should tell us something. That's how close to Africa this story is uh, in some ways. In April 27th, 1864, a protest, most of the men in Company I, 
of the 102nd refused to sign their names for $10 a month until parity with white troops. Now, the white officers of the 102nd United States Colored Troops did not join their brothers in the 54th and 55th Massachusetts and refused pay. So white officers were more racist in the 102nd USCT than they were in the 54th and 55th. The regiment is largely broken up into companies for picket, fatigue, and garrison duty, and then split up all across the island. So 20 soldiers on this little island, 10 soldiers on this little island. This photograph you're seeing here may be the only photograph we have of the 102nd United States Colored Troops in the field. That, that is black troops at Coosa Ferry off the coast of South Carolina. And that's exactly where the 102nd would have been guarding. So it's likely that those are, if not the 102nd, they are troops that they, they were in the same um, uh, uh, brigades with. Uh, between April and July 1864, uh, there's picket at St. Helena, Jenkins, and Hilton Head Islands. Uh, in May 23rd, 1864, the 1st Michigan Colored Infantry is officially recognized as the 102nd United States Colored Troops. On August 1st, 1864, uh, we have this note from a white officer named Wilbur Nelson. All of the quotes will be from Wilbur Nelson when we read this. So this is a white officer talking, and he's not the most sympathetic man, but he gives lots of insights into life on the islands. It says, our men celebrated the anniversary of the liberation of slaves in the West Indies this morning. Some of the men made very good speeches. At four o'clock, we ran down to Hilton Head where we do, drew new guns. So that's how August 1st was celebrated. You got new guns and you actually got on a ship and went into battle for the first time. So black troops from Ypsilanti, from Michigan, are bringing their abolitionist traditions with them. August 1st, Emancipation Day, is a very specific celebration to the end of slavery in Canada. And it meant something very strong for Black people in the Detroit River area and in Canada. And also something very strong, obviously, for Black people in Jamaica and Tr Trinidad. And to this day, Emancipation Day celebrations happen in places like Windsor, Ontario, and Kingston, Jamaica. We have that unique tie to uh, uh, the Black diaspora in the Caribbean through August 1st, Emancipation Day. And that, again, is brought, so it's not that the traditions that we think of the Civil War, Juneteenth and Emancipation Proclamation and all of that, that's not the tradition that folks are bringing with them. They already have an abolitionist tradition that they're bringing with them into the island. And nothing is more telling that they celebrate August 1st uh, by getting new guns and going into battle. Uh, August 30th, the regiment was dismembered and assigned to guard duty in three nearby islands until the end of December. August 16th, 1864, this afternoon, four rebels came near shore in a boat. Our pickards fired on them and made them come ashore and took three of them prisoner. One to tried to run and was shot through the head and killed. So these kind of incidences are happening all the time. Just a few weeks later, another incident, this is... Uh, Disturbing and, and profoundly sad, a slave tried to swim the river at the ferry this morning, but got drowned in the attempt just before he got to our side. So they were trying to escape from slavery. They were crossing the ocean <laughs> in, to try to s swim to the islands off the coast, and people were watching them do it, and they watched him die, right? So that's, that's what this means. This is life or death. This is freedom or slavery. November 20th, 1864, in the evening, I went to a large Negro meeting. They appear very earnest in their devotions. So no matter what white officers are doing and no matter what the world of the Union Army is, black people also have their own world in that Union Army, their own organizing, their own officers even, right? So if you didn't want to go to a black or a white officer, you could go to the leading black man in your unit who would be recognized by other black soldiers, but not by the white officers, right? So we have all all of these different kinds of things happen within Union Army. Finally, into the field. Uh, again, August 1st, 1864, celebration of Emancipation Day. They drew arms and sailed from Beaufort aboard, aboard the gunship Canocus. And that's a, an actual picture of the gunship. So this is, that would be like a spaceship at the time. This was a new, a very, very brand new piece of technology, these iron ships. So they were, they were entering like, these were, you know, farmers and 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 workers and all of that, and and people who had been held in slavery, and and they're joining the most highest technological advancements you can imagine at that time. To us, it looks like an old battleship, but it would have been, 
it would have been a sight. It would have been something you had never seen before. You had never seen before. On August 3rd, they arrived in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, with a couple of white units. They marched to Baldwin 20 miles. Now, this is August in Florida. This is August in Florida. 20 miles on the Florida Railroad. Their, their, their aim was to free people in this raid and to destroy the railroads. It was a very hot day and the march was a hard one. It was low, swampy, desolate country. Baldwin is a railroad st station with three or four old houses. August 5th, we did not move today. Alligators are thick and frogs serenade us nightly. The regiment tore up about three mile of railroad tracks, burned the ties and bent the rails. August 10th, our regiment went out six miles on the railroad to tear up tracks. We had just gotten to work when a party of rebels fired into the left of the regiment from the woods. We deployed skirmishers and went after them, but they had gone when they heard us. So August 10th, 1864, over three years after the Civil War begins, Michigan black troops get their first real taste of combat uh, then. Uh, uh, while outside Baldwin, a Confederate cavalry unit suddenly attacked the 102nd after a brief skirmish, they were repulsed. Uh, they began a grueling 100-mile march, destroying railroad tracks as they went through extremely poor weather. Finally, August 19th, we reached Magnolia at sundown after marching 18 miles. The fruits of the raid are some 60 Negroes, several of which would have joined the 102nd United States Colored Troops. And again, this is the language this man is using from his diaries. Two old guns and 10 mules. They build a fort down there to protect it, and then they embark on transports back to Beaufort in, on August 30th. So they're only there for a month, but that's their first taste. And you can see it's an isolated activity, right? It's Black troops are being placed in these isolated activities. Robert Smalls, there is Robert Smalls. Now that's him much later in life, but you can imagine him as a young man. If people don't know about Robert Smalls, he got his name. He was enslaved uh, in, in South Carolina, uh, but he was a pilot of a ship and he actually stole a Confederate vessel and got his family and friends and a bunch of other people on it and, and sailed that vessel into the Union Naval Lines and then gave the vessel to the Union Navy. He was so, it was a huge, you can imagine how celebrated this was, especially for black people, truly heroic. Uh, uh, Robert Smalls would be commissioned the only captain, black captain of a US naval ship, and he will keep control of the planter and, and captain the planter as a, um, as a troop transport ship. So black troops from Michigan will actually get on the planter November 28, 1864. And we know they knew exactly who Robert Smalls was and they know exactly who the planter is. It was already celebrated when they get on it. And even the white officers are excited. You can see them put an exclamation point in their book saying, we got on the planter with Robert Smalls. So they, even the white troops are celebrating uh, their brush with greatness by knowing Robert Smalls. So Robert Smalls brings the troops on the planter uh, the 54th, 55th Massachusetts, a couple of other units, both black and white. Uh, and this is an attempt to break some of the Confederate rail lines uh, going from Savannah to Charleston. You can see that there. Um, the 102nd under General Foster and about 5,500 men at, at Boyd's Landing engaged the Confederates at Honey Hill, Tiffley Neck, and Devoe Neck. These were atrocious, atrocious uh, battles in which uh, the Confederates won quite handily, uh, primarily because they were in defensive positions and all of that kind of stuff. We'll look a little bit about it. You can see this wonderful map from the time that somebody has sketched of the battle. And you can see the different U.S. colored troops. Here you can see the 55th Massachusetts. Woo! Yeah. Sorry. Okay. You can see the 55th Massachusetts. You can see that the 55th Massachusetts is right next to a white unit right next to a white unit, right next to a black unit, right next to a white unit. So you actually have, although they're not internally desegregated, each regiment is white and black, you get white and black units fighting side by side, which means they are utterly reliant on one another, utterly reliant on one, one another. Uh, at this battle, the 102nd United States Color Troops will actually distinguish itself greatly in the battle, um, but only white officers will be recognized for their achievements. So what happens is uh, a detachment of the 102nd arrive on the scene as the battle has already been fought mostly. Uh, so they're late because of bad weather. The planter has to, has to uh, 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 more for a night before people are allowed to get off. 
uh, and the 102nd uh, 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 are, are told to go bring back some Union artillery that's been captured by the Confederates so it doesn't fall into Confederate hands. At first, Captain Arad Lindsay was ordered to take Company D forward. They rush forward. Uh, Lindsay is immediately killed. Several other men are killed and wounded. They fall back. In the second attempt, a detail of 30 men uh, of Company A rush forward, and it's led by Lieutenant, a white Lieutenant Orson of Bennett. Company A includes many Ypsilanti men. They rush forward. They're hauled the cannon off the field by hand. They, they're able to win that, and Orson Bennett wins the Medal of Honor, and the 30 black men underneath them don't get any recognition, right? So the Medal of Honor, we often say, is earned. Well, no, nah, it's actually won in part depending on the color of your skin, um, uh, but not the black enlisted men. So, uh, the But the activities of those black enlisted men is the reason why Bennett won his Medal of Honor. It wouldn't have been possible without that. Honey Hill cost the lives of more members of the 102nd than any other engagement. Ypsilantians John Gray and Joseph Morgan were wounded in the battle. And here's Captain C.S. Montague, a captain, a white captain of the U.S. Colored Troops, talking about Honey Hill. There had been skirmishing for most of the way, but here they met the enemy in force. And here a sanguinary battle was fought, which was the first real fight which our e e regiment ever engaged. On one side of the detail of 300 men, the 54th Mass was drawn up. On the other side, a white regiment the 127th in New York. Here our forces sustained a charge from the enemy and charged in turn. In this affair, the 102nd covered themselves in glory. Supporting Sherman, the railroad to Charleston. They were pushed back in that early attempt in, in uh, uh, late November, early December to break into the rail line and, 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 and break it going from Savannah to Charleston. Uh, but they go in again uh, in February 1865, and they wreak havoc. They wreak havoc on the Confederate interior. Um, and this is actually a black soldier from Michigan, from the 102nd, wrote this to the weekly Anglo-African, a newspaper in New York City. And it says, from the Kambahi River to Charleston, we burned every bale of cotton and raised every plantation and rail detail. Depot. They'll not soon forget when the color soldier marched through South Carolina. And no, they're still complaining about it. They still are talking about it. Uh, so that was a member of the Michigan raised 102nd. And you notice here, this is actually pictures of the actual railroads that they're destroying. So this is the kind of environment off the coast or on the, on the coast there of South Carolina that they have to fight and 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 march through and you can see here this is an actual picture of this very destruction of of these railroads and again this is you've heard of Sherman's march to the sea this is to support Sherman's march to the sea Sherman did not himself he was the only black or the only white he was the only general of the Union army to not use black troops in combat roles uh, but but they were used in secondary roles uh, here off the coast of South Carolina. Liberation of Charleston. One of the most dramatic points in the war, Charleston has been held by the Confederacies for four years while the Union Army is just on the doorstep trying to get in. The, the Charleston is again the seat of the Confederacy. It's not the capital, Richmond is, but it is the most important town, the wealthiest town, the town where slavery has the most kind of it, uh, hardened adherents, fire eaters, and that kind of thing. Uh, and at, finally, because of that maneuver that black troops make, uh, Charleston is able to fall in February of 1865, nearly four years into the war. And the very first troops to enter are black troops of the 55th Massachusetts Infantry, as you see here in this photograph. And you can see the, the in, formerly enslaved people of Charleston. It, this must have been a biblical moment, a biblical moment to see formerly enslaved men with guns and uniforms march through their town as an army of liberation. And as they marched through Charleston, they were literally singing John Brown's body. Old John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave while weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save. But though he lost his life while struggling for the slave, his soul is marching on. That was sung by Ypsilanti men right there in that photograph in February, 1865 through the ruins of Charleston. The Civil War was a revolution, and nothing tells you that more than this moment of jubilee. 
this moment of jubilee. That white officer you're seeing leading there is um, uh, Colonel Hollowell. And Colonel Hollowell will look more at them. These are radical abolitionist officers. His actual older brother, Richard Hollowell, uh, who was too old to join the 54th Massachusetts, was the man who retrieved John Brown's body after hanging and brought it up to Elba, New York for burial. So that's how close um, John Brown is to some of this activity. Okay, so Potter's Raid, and then we're, we're gonna start ending up here. I know I've been talking quite a bit. At the very end of the war, the 54th, 55th Massachusetts, a couple of other black units locally raised, largely formerly enslaved, the 33 and 32nd United States colored troops, uh, as well as white troops begin a absolutely uh, harrowing three-week raid through South Carolina at the very end of the war. And their goal is to destroy all the railroads, plantations, and cotton between the coast and Camden. So almost to Columbia, which is the capital. You can see Columbia, the capital of South Carolina here, which has already burnt, been burned by Sherman's troops. So they don't need to burn that, but they're gonna destroy everything from the coast up to Camden. And this expedition is vastly majority black troops. It's at the very end of the war. And uh, there would be three weeks of constant battles and combat as these black troops make their way through the absolute heart of the Confederacy, leaving ashes behind them. Um, each one of these points where the arrow stops is where a battle or a skirmish happened. So you can just see boom, 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 as they're making their way through this area. General Edward Potter here is the leader of that raid. And you can actually see a photograph or a, uh, a woodcut of uh, uh, some of Potter's troops on the left in, during that raid. April 9th, 1865, this is the day that the Civil War ends, but it was not ending for our, our soldiers in South Carolina. On Easter Day, April 9th, 1865, the Battle of Dingles Mill was fought south of Sumterville. At three in the morning, Potter's Raiders came from the direction of King Street. They were joined by Colonel El Edward Hallowell's troops who had crossed the river at Pocatillo Bridge. Confederate mi militiamen dug into the breastworks and awaited the arrival of Union forces. Colonel Potter ordered Colonel Hollowell's colored troops in this uh, to this flanking column routing the Confederates. So they went all the way around the swamps. And the reason they were able to do that is because black people who were enslaved in that area were telling them exactly where to go. They had eyes and ears on the ground telling them exactly how to maneuver around the Confederate position. That very same day, General Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. So even though the war is over in the North, the 102nd United States Colored Troops is now engaged in its most consistent combat of the entire war. Quaker abolitionist brothers Richard Price Hollowell, this is the man right here who got um, who got John Brown's body home. And his other brothers are both the leaders of the 54th and 55th Massachusetts. These are Norwood Hallowell and, and Edward Hallowell. And these two men are severely wounded multiple times in the combat. Um, these two men will also refuse pay until black soldiers under them are given equal pay. These are very radical abolitionists. These are men who worked the Underground Railroad before the war even began. Um, one other person is here, Alfred Hartwell of the 55th Massachusetts. He would become Colonel of the 55th at Massachusetts after Edward or Norwood Hollowell was so badly wounded he couldn't continue. Uh, and Alfred Hartwell will also be extremely badly wounded in this war uh, fighting with black troops. And um, all of these men will go on to be leading civil rights advocates after the war and become uh, uh, proponents of full black citizenship after the war. So these are these are real heroes too, who really suffered for this, uh, really gave everything in their lives for this, and some of, in some cases gave their lives uh, for this, this cause. So an army of liberation. As Potter's troops move through South Carolina, they leave destruction in their wake. They burn all the rail cars, cotton stores, depots, and plantations. We know that nearly 6,000 people, 6,000 enslaved people are liberated from plantations in this process. Many of the people doing the liberating are people who had been enslaved before. Uh, 
so we've got people freeing their fellows, right? This isn't freedom from without. This is freedom from within. And you get this bottom rail on top. During this Potter's Raid, you literally have Black people pulling out foremen, white foremen, accusing them of rape or, or attacking or, or hurting, harming enslaved people and having them summarily executed. This happened during that week. Formerly enslaved people put their former foremen and owners on trial and executed them in the streets and lanes of South Carolina. Just for this week, just for about two weeks, it was like this. But it was over what you can imagine what that opened up, both in fears for white people and promises of liberation for black people. White troops with the 25th Ohio, known for its abolitionist sympathies, were also, they're from Northern Ohio, to, uh, Toledo, Lorraine, Sandusky. And within the 25th Ma uh, Ohio Infantry, this is white unit, are members of the typographical union. So they're, they, these are early labor organizers and they're early uh, labor union members of uh, uh, typesetting for newspapers. And every time they get to a Southern town, they take over the old newspaper and they, they put a new paper out called the Banner of Freedom, announcing the end of slavery, announcing the end of the old Southern aristocracy and urging white people to get with the program and an urging black people to join the Union Army. These are white people putting out this newspaper at each town, the banner of freedom, and you can see it right there. So even the white troops, and many of them would have been racist when the war began, are infected by this revolutionary activity. They now see themselves as freedom fighters. They now see themselves as freedom fighters. And when you see yourself as a freedom fighter rather than a soldier for somebody else's war, it changes how you fight. It changes how, what you want to see in that war and what you want to see for yourself. With over a dozen fights with Confederates, it was the most sustained combat. For generation, Potter's Raid would be remembered quite differently by white and black South Carolina. You can get a little sense of what Potter's Raid looked like by this photo of Sherman's March the Sea there. At the very end of this campaign, as, the, as they're destroying the plantations, there's another final battle. And this is a week after the Civil War has ended, but there are, there are no cell phones to tell the people in the swamps of South Carolina that the war has ended. So these men will actually die after the war is over. And these, some of the, these men, two of these Ypsilanti men will be some of the very final men. In fact, the final officer to die in the Civil War was uh, an officer in the 102nd killed at this battle, a white man. But these are the final two, some of the final two black men to die in combat in the entire Civil War because the Civil War is over. They just haven't been told it yet. 10 days after Lee's surrender, Ypsilantians Jesse Oliver of the 102nd, the only Ypsilantian to die in combat with the 102nd, and Charles Scott of the 54th Massachusetts were both killed in a relatively minor skirmish around Boykins Mill, South Carolina, and were among the very last soldiers to die in the war. Uh, and their bodies were not returned to Michigan, and it was too far inland to bring to the cemetery at Buford. So that is where these men lie today. Both, both uh, Jesse Oliver and Charles Scott lie in the ground near Boykins Mill in the swamps off of South Carolina. Uh, what you're seeing there where it says 54th Massachusetts, 25th Ohio, and all of that, this is the only monument in the entire country that has the name 102nd United States Colored Troops on it. So this is the only monument to uh, Black Civil War Michigan soldiers other than our Michigan um, historic uh, markers. And unfortunately, it is also a monument that celebrates the Confederate Home Guard as well. So it's not just a monument for the, the Union troops, but a monument to all the troops who died uh, and fought uh, at Boykins Mill. So coming home from the Civil War, after you have an experience like that that has changed your life, you are never the same. You are never the same in all different kinds of ways, in all different kinds of ways. But this war, I mean, before the war, you were a black person with no rights. And now you have had a gun in your hand and that means a lot, especially in America, uh, and you have participated in a colossal undertaking which has overturned the most powerful slave system humanity has ever known. And in the process, the largest dissolution of private property in human history up to that time, the abolition of slavery was the largest switch in property 
in human history, in all of human history up until that time, you participated in that. You did not come home to be a second class citizen. You came home to demand your full rights. And so you see William Carter, a returned color soldier, drew a pistol on William Malian. This is from Ypsilanti for some supposed insult. Carter was arrested, but settled the matter by partying with a portion of his bounty money. Bad whiskey lay at the bottom of the affair. So when you used to be afraid to be a black man of white folks anymore, in Ypsilanti, somebody says something to you, you could pull out a pistol. I mean, that's what you're used to now. And it just kind of changes relationships. Uh, you also see the, the, the relationships, the personal relationships formed by these comrades during the war will last the rest of their lives. Here you see this Thomas Rodman, Robert Jarvis, George Thompson, Ben Harper, Dick Hamilton, Levi Kwan, and John Collins. I know that's John Collins. are all members of the colored, colored band who left, left last Tuesday on the Pacific Express to Kalamazoo, and then they're going out to St. Louis. All of these men were in the band together in the United States Colored Troops. That's where they met. And their, their, both their musical relationship and their personal relationship continues after the war. And they're actually using that relationship for work and for a job. Um, uh, a band in a circus was quite a, uh, uh, not an, uh, it was not unusual for Black people to join these bands as a way to get around the country. Uh, the 102nd United States Colored Regiment with several members in Ypsilanti will hold its annual reunion in Ann Arbor. And when do they hold the reunion? What day is that? August 1st, right? So they're still celebrating Emancipation Day and the struggle that predates the Civil War. That predates the Civil War. The Hart Lodge, number two of the free, this is the Black Masonic Lodge. And you can see all of these people are... Civil War veterans, and there was Black Masonic lodges within the Union Army. And in fact, the Black Masons were, within the Black Masons are secret Black anti-slavery societies that organized Black units throughout the North. The Prince Hall Masons were very important to Black organizing into the Union Army. Here you see the um, celebration of the 15th Amendment, which gives Black men the right to vote. And look who's the president of that. William Carter, the same guy who drew the pistol on the racist white guy, is president of this day's uh, Emancipation Day celebrations. And, and those celebrations, when black men get the right to vote, they go up to a white lawyer, uh, um, Lima Decatur Norris, who uh, participated as with the slave owners in the Dred Scott decision, and they literally repeat the Dred Scott decision back to him in front of his door and say, and you can't say that anymore. That, that's how potent the Civil War was for Black attitudes of self-determination. It, it opened a box that was impossible to put back in together. Okay, so I'm just going to wrap up here a little bit and say a little bit about Ypsilanti in the Civil War. More than 4,000 soldiers from Washtenaw County served during the Civil War. Nearly 500 perish, more than all of the other wars fought by men from this county combined. So let me just show you that again. Let me try to put that in perspective. Washtenaw County in 1860 had about 17,000 people in it at the beginning of the Civil War. Out of those 17,000 people, half are men, half of those men are uh, soldier age men, 500 of them will die. At the beginning of World War II in 1940, Washtenaw County had a population of 110,000 people and about 400 of those 110,000 people would die in World War II. So if the Civil War is not just a greater absolute number, as a relative number, it mean it's the impact is uh, indescribable, right? It's, it impacts everybody. But for Ypsilanti, it's only about 25% of white men who fight in the Civil War. 25% of available white men, meaning men, white men who are of soldier age, will fight in the Civil War. 75% of black men of soldier age will fight in the Civil War. So when people tell you the Civil War was a white man's war or something like that, it was absolutely not. Black people participated at a much, much higher level in the Civil War than white populations participated, right? The entire black community is involved. Nearly every single family will have a father, son, brother go off to the war, while only one quarter of white families can say that, right? So the Civil War, while Black people are only 200,000 members of the Union Army, 
it's inconceivable to me that the Union Army would have won, both without black men as soldiers and also without black women supporting uh, those Union uh, troops in the field, both black and white. Uh, almost all of the support for Union troops in the South, cooking, doing laundry, cleaning, all of that was done by black women escaping slavery. Uh, and without that, it's inconceivable that the Civil War would be won. Also interesting, the majority of the Union Army in the Civil War, about 2.2 out of the four, or uh, 1.2 out of the 2.2 million members, the majority of the Union Army was not white men born in the United States. The majority of the Union Army were either immigrants or they were black men from the United States. That is who the, made up the majority of the Union Army. And I think that's profound and should tell us that immigrants and black people saved this country. Without immigrants and black people, there would have been no victory in, for the Union in the Civil War. More than 30 normal students, so that's members of Eastern Michigan University, these would have been young men training to be teachers, joined together to Company E of the 17th Massachusetts Infantry. That unit will be almost entirely wiped out at the Battle of Antietam. Other Ypsilantians joined the 4th and 27th Infantries as well as a number of other cavalry regiments. There are many, many Medal of Honor recipients in Ypsilanti. The Grand Army of the Republic, which is black or black and white Civil War veterans. You can actually see a picture of a Grand Army Republic men marching in Ypsilanti. And here is one black man marching with them here in Ypsilanti. And I actually believe that's John Anderson. Um, uh, you can see here the Ypsilanti monument, which I encourage everybody to go visit in Highland Cemetery, which was created in 1895. Can you see what that says? It says they died to make their country free. Right, so that's what the monument here in Ypsilanti says. Here is the list of Ypsilanti's Black Civil War heroes. There are over 70 Black, in fact, now my list is over 90 Black men with Ypsilanti connections who fought in the Civil War. The vast majority fought with the 102nd United States Colored Troops, but many also fought with the 54th and 55th, as we said earlier. And then many also would have been from other units who ended up moving to Ypsilanti at the, after the war, including many from Ohio units. And those Ohio units would have seen the ferocious combat south of Petersburg and were part of the Army of the James and the only all black corps in the Union Army, the 25th Corps in Butler's Army of the James. Uh, and this was, aside from the experience of Fort Wagner, that experience of the 25th Corps below Richmond was the most important experience for black troops in the Civil War. Black troops were, just like Charleston, the first troops to enter Richmond. Uh, and when Lincoln entered Richmond for the first time, and I can't imagine seeing this, he would have entered with a phalanx of black cavalry troops. That's how he would have entered uh, uh, Richmond for the first time. I would have liked to have seen that. Okay, uh, here are just a few of the uh, obituaries of men who fought in the Civil War and died in Ypsilanti. There are dozens and dozens of these. As soon as the pandemic is over and the weather is nice, we will go on a walking tour of Highland Cemetery and visit the graves of these individual men and learn their individual stories. But the, the cemetery you're seeing behind here is the cemetery uh, at Beaufort, uh, South Carolina. It's the Federal Union Cemetery of Beaufort, South Carolina, and many, many Michigan men are buried there. You can imagine how difficult it was to return a body that had died in the Civil War, especially during summer. This We're talking before refrigeration. It was very difficult, and unless you had a lot of money, your, your loved one generally did not, and it was winter, your loved one generally did not make it home if they died in the field. So the vast majority of Black Ypsilantians who died in the field in fact, everyone that I know of who died either of disease or of um, combat uh, is buried in the South. None, none of their bodies were able to make it back to Ypsilanti. Okay, thank you all so much for that. Uh, here are two of those men buried here in Ypsilanti, Jeremiah Snively, and we may have a relative of Jeremiah's on our call tonight, and David York. David York is that uh, one of those two brothers that joined the Union Army December 8th, 1863, when Sojourner Truth and the train came through Ypsilanti. His younger brother was only 15 when he joined, George York, and he lied about his age. Uh, and he actually never left Ypsilanti. He got tuberculosis 
and died before leaving Ypsilanti, but that means that he is the youngest member of the 102nd United States Colored Troops to die during the Civil War, it was George York, and he died here in Ypsilanti. Uh, he never left Ypsilanti. So both the youngest member of the 102nd and the last member of the 102nd to die uh, during the Civil War were from Ypsilanti. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy now to take any questions or comments you might have. And uh, if you are interested